Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT, and Dragon Ball Super. I think Dragon Ball is a franchise that has transcended the term legendary. Making its first debut in Weekly Shonen Jump on December 3rd, 1984, going all the way to June 5th, 1995. Dragon Ball was a hit, so it only made sense to continue the story of our not-so-little-anymore hero Goku with Dragon Ball Z. Now, when Dragon Ball Z made its way to America, it was a smash hit. I feel like myself and everyone I knew was outside trying their hardest to fire Kamehameha's on the playground to no avail. Except Josh, who swears he did it once at home. If it happened while no one was watching Josh, then it didn't happen! And as we know, when anything becomes a moderate success, markets feel the need to capitalize on it in every shape, way, and form. And what better option than video games? Son of a bitch, I'm in! Now, Dragon Ball Z had its little slew of video games before, such as Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22 and Dragon Ball GT Final Bout, for example. But the one that absolutely hit the ground running was the Dragon Ball Z Budokai series on PlayStation 2 and GameCube. Dragon Ball Z Budokai was my first experience with the franchise as a whole. It blew me away with its sweet roster of characters, cool transformations, and special moves. Seeing such high-octane battles, I, I couldn't keep my eyes off the screen while watching my older brother play it. I had only ever played such hits as Bubsy 3D and Frogger on the PS1, so I just had to play it for myself. And once I did, I was hooked. And let me tell you, I had a hell of a time playing them, being only around seven years old at the time. I was constantly having to pray to Connie for an SOS from my older brother. Specifically that awful Raditz part at the beginning. God, don't push your luck! Gohan, forgive your father. But we're not here to talk about this installment in the series, though, are we? I'm going to be talking about the slept-on and oftentimes forgotten member of the Budokai series, Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2. Yeah, I think you're starting to see a pattern here with my videos. Find the one people hate, say it's good, etc. But these are my honest opinions, though, I swear. Keyword there being opinion. This video is going to be a hair different than the other ones, because I'm going to try not to just sit here for 20 minutes and talk about the story of the game, because what Dragon Ball fan hasn't heard the mainline story retold in every other Dragon Ball Z game? So I'm going to try my best to throw a little flair into it. I'm more so just going to be talking about why I like it, touch on some of the things this game did that was unique, and why I think it's a little slept on gem before we got the second coming of Christ in Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. So let's just go ahead and pop the old disc into the GameCube here and... <laughs> yeah! Man, Dragon Ball Z games back in the day always knew how to hype you up for the game through its intros. Especially Budokai Tenkaichi. So first things first. Arriving at the main menu here, we've got Dragon World, which is what a big chunk of this video is gonna contain. Next, we've got Dueling, which is where you'll do your standard fights in this game. Here you can select your favorite character and go one-on-one -on -one with the CPU. You can also go up against a friend of yours and pick Kid Buu if you want to ruin said friendship with Couch Co-op. Which more games need to bring back. Or just pit the computer against itself and play God watching the chaos ensue. That was pretty fun. After that is the World Tournament. This mode has you, and anyone else in the room with a controller, sort of just do as the name says. Join a tournament varying in difficulty. There's Novice, Adept, and if you're a real glutton for punishment, advanced. Each difficulty has a set amount of prize money you can win from being the runner-up or becoming the world champ yourself. The amount you receive from winning a tournament is decided by the difficulty you've chosen. The higher the difficulty, the higher the payout. But I think we all know the best strategy to win. Just try your hardest to ring out anybody and everybody. Afterwards, we've got training, edit skills in the skill shop, and options. But I really don't think I need to go over those. Do I? Now that we've done a small brush up on the contents of the game, let's jump right back into the meat of it, Dragon World. Our story mode opens with a brief history of the Dragon Balls, followed by Goku's job as the world's volunteer protector and the tale of his journey thus far. All transitioning to our first saga of the story mode, the Saiyan Saga. Right off the bat, I'm sure you noticed that the sitting here sort of looks like a board game. 
Well, that's because it is. Oh my god, bro. Damn. No, 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 hold on. Let, let, let me explain a little bit before you leave. The story mode here is like any other. You follow a semi-full voice actor story of Dragon Ball Z, except it's on a board game style playing field, where at the beginning of each saga or level, you pick your characters that you want to play as. Goku always being a mandatory player, and you move your pieces around the board. You can move your piece wherever you'd like, sometimes in a race to stop another piece from reaching a goal point before you do. On the board is items like skills, power-ups, or even the dragon radar, which will then direct you across the board to find all seven Dragon Balls. Now, if you're a connoisseur like myself, <laughs> you play the story mode with a friend, having one of you play Goku, and the other their choice of character, and you pass the controller back and forth, making the story mode two-player. The secondary character will even sometimes have a unique dialogue, creating a fun what-if conversation or dialogue kin into the events of the arc. Now, there are cutscenes in this, but there aren't at the same time. Goku and your pieces will talk every now and then through a chat bubble, or they'll have a sort of overlay cutscene on top of the game board. Personally, this is one of my favorite story modes for a Dragon Ball Z game. Because rather than others that are just fight, cutscene, a fight, cutscene, it gives you a little room to have some fun and throw a little curveball your way. Getting back into it, Nappa and Raditz show up first. One of the few, but not huge, liberties this game takes with the story. Our objective is to stop Nappa from getting the Dragon Balls. So now we move our pieces around the board, find the Dragon Radar, and make our way to the Dragon Balls before Raditz or Nappa get their grimy little hands on them. You'll move around the board, fighting Cybermen and other adversaries as they try to stop you from reaching your goal. As you can see here, the main game pieces have a little green health bar. And each time you beat a boss, or lose a fight against one, a little block will be taken away until the boss is defeated, or you'll receive a game over. Another fun fact, this was the first Budokai game to have the forward E or the forward circle shortcut for moves like the Kamehameha that everyone loves so much in Budokai 3. Once you've beaten Nappa and Raditz and gathered the Dragon Balls, you'll be transported to the next area starting the Namek slash Frieza saga. But for some reason, we're at Muscle Tower. Hey, I won't complain about a little bit of OG Dragon Ball representation. Our objective here is to defeat Frieza, but in order to get to him, we gotta slap around Raccoon and Captain Ginyu. Ginyu, that's my money! Forgive me. So once we mopped the floor with them, we head to the bottom of the board, reaching Frieza. Frieza's impressed that we beat Captain Ginyu, and we're impressed at how short and angry someone can be. You're a lot more puny than I thought. Now that all the pleasantries are out of the way, and we've gotten some new skills, we hit him with the Kaio punch in the face! Yeah! So we've reached Namek, and now we have to fight Captain Ginyu and Raccoon one more time, whilst also finally putting Frieza down for the count. The game gives us another enemy on Namek, that being Vegeta, because the Prince of All Saiyans had a pretty big role to play this saga. Not that he didn't during the Saiyan saga, just one of those liberties I mentioned earlier. But once you beat him, the Prince joins your group, stating that he doesn't think we can beat Frieza unless we work together. Ah, Vegeta. Come on, admit it. You like having us around. Once you finish rubbing Ginyu's and Raccoon's faces in the dirt and reach Frieza, we get the albino lizard's health lowered to zero, and Frieza gets so tilted, screaming, kicking his feet on the ground, that he throws the ultimate plan B at us. Blowing up the planet. Then I'd rather die by my own hand. I'm going to destroy this planet! Wait, what? Goku manages to get away just in time, crashing our escape pod back to Earth and into the Android slash Cell Saga. Waiting for us back on Earth is Dr. Jiro. <laughs> I finally found you, Goku. He's been hiding in secret, finishing his research so that once it was complete, he could exact his revenge on Goku for stopping the Red Ribbon Army so many years ago. <sighs> Come on, man, you got stomped by a kid in like 88. Let it go. Dr. Jiro plants his Cyberman that he's presumably genetically modified in a superior way into the ground, giving us our warm up. Upon wiping out the Cybermen and defeating Dr. Jiro, no time is wasted as the androids we all know and love appear, numbers 16, 17, and 18. Much like the anime and manga, even though Dr. Jiro has been defeated, the androids plan on going through with their programming to eliminate Goku. Because, you know, teenagers. So one after the other, you fend off the androids as they relentlessly come after your party, slowly but surely chipping away at their health. Eventually you manage to take down the androids before Dr. Jiro's masterpiece appears. The perfect android himself, Cell. My name is Cell. Cell states that because of our bout with the androids, they were weakened enough for him to absorb 17 and 18, making it that much easier for him to achieve his perfect form. 
As you can tell, some of the many liberties the game takes that I mentioned earlier are all more so for the sake of fun and to match the events that have unfolded in your playthrough. If you choose the right character, recreating certain fights from the show's canon, you get those cutscenes I mentioned earlier, which will resemble the actual events of what happened along with unlocking characters and skills for your ever-growing roster. We'll also get certain characters showing up a little earlier, or later, or moments like this here, where Cell says that instead of the tournament, it's whoever can catch him first. This is because Cell will teleport to a random spot on the game board throughout your battle with him. All to try and add a little zest to the tabletop playstyle. So Cell squirts out his little gremlins from his tail, and Goku grabs his roach spray as you take out the Cell Juniors and slap, punch, kick, and kiss. You way back and forth to Cell. Once you've chased him around the board enough time, Cell will finally be defeated and his saga will come to a close. However, Goku states that he feels uneasy like something's wrong. So Goku and his group head to the source of the energy to see what's up. And we kind of just leave Cell there to sit in his own shit. We reach the source of the energy as our game board changes to a city-like setting, and we are greeted by the Supreme Kai, or Mr. Shin. Goku mentions a strange aura from Supreme Kai, and we're given our next objective. Defeat the Supreme Kai! So we select our two extra characters to join us, and we charge headfirst to battle God. After grabbing the Supreme Kai by his mohawk and throwing him out of the playing field, Bobbidi and Deborah show up with Majin Buu's cocoon. Upon reaching them on the game board, Bobbidi will possess Vegeta, creating the baddest motherfucker in the series, besides Super Saiyan 4 Goku and Cell Saga Gohan. And on top of that, Bobbidi resurrects Frieza and Cell as his minions, creating a whole playing field of opposition. A fun segment here is your goal is to stop Buu's resurrection. However, each time you fight someone on the field, it will fill Majin Buu's resurrection meter. Three fights being all it takes to fill it. If you're able to avoid the other pieces on the board and reach Bobbidi, you stop the resurrection and Bobbidi heads for the hills, furious that we foiled his plans. How has this happened? The game board changes to a sky pier and we catch up with Bobbidi and his minions. The game then gives us our new objective, defeat Bobbidi. Which shouldn't be too hard seeing as he looks like a plucked ball sack. So we rip the M stickers off of Frieza and Cell's foreheads and send him back to Hiffle. However, Bobbidi was somehow able to successfully bring back Majin Buu. Bobbidi tries to control Buu, but he pops Bobbidi right into his mouth and crunches down on him like a Frere Rocher. Freeing Vegeta from his mind control, but still leaving him on the board as an enemy piece. Why is he still an enemy? Uh, I don't know. I don't have an explanation. So we reach the recently resurrected Majin Buu, and we put him through the meat grinder made of our fists, draining his health to zero. It's not over yet, though. As Majin Buu transforms and leaves the area, saying he refuses to die. The game board changes, and Majin Buu reappears inside the hyperbolic time chamber. Buu states that he sensed a strong power level inside the chamber, and demands that they face him now. No longer able to hide from Buu, Piccolo tells Goten and Trunks to fuse, and we get the strong fighter Buu is after the whole time, Gotenks. It's Gotenks! I don't know about you guys, but Gotenks may quite possibly be my favorite fusion. Other than Vegito. As we make our way to Majin Buu to lay the smacketh down on him, depending on what path you take, Majin Buu may either absorb Cell or Frieza. It's just another fun route that this game takes by introducing some fun what-if fusions, like Majin Buu and Cell, Majin Buu and Frieza, even some fusions between Yamcha and Tien, making Tien Cha, and the fan-favorite fusion between Goku and Hercule, Gokul. Yeah, that's a real thing. After beating Majin Buu here, he'll absorb Gotenks, and then just kind of bails, with Goku begging him not to leave. Don't run away, Majin Buu! No, I, I don't think you said it nice enough to him, Goku. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, he's gone. The board changes back to a cityscape, and we see that Gohan and the Supreme Kai are waiting for us. Goku thought that Gohan was killed by Buu, but it turns out he's alive and well. Gohan talks about his training with the Supreme Kai before we get back to our new objective. Beat the shit out of Majin Buu once and for all. Again. After a few bouts with Buu as Gohan, Buu is so ashamed by the stylish ass beating he just got from Gohan that he regresses into his most primal, evil, and final form. That's what I'm talking about! Supreme Kai advises that we lead him away from Earth and finish things up on the planet of the Kais. Upon arriving, Buu's not too far off either. The board of course changes to a planet of the Kais and we're given our final objective. Defeat Majin Buu. For good. And so our final objective of the game begins. The board this time is littered with many Cybermen and Cell Juniors. Even Cell and Frieza make a return to get one last shot at you. And of course, there's Majin Buu. Stop healing the opposition, Dende! I don't know about anybody else, but I had a hell of a time getting through this part. With all the enemies on the board at once, it added a little more pressure as you try to preserve your health for the already difficult Majin Buu. Once you've cleared the board, 
or just ignored them altogether and gunned it straight for Boo, the final series of battles gets underway. And let me tell you, Boo puts you through the ringer. It's a good thing that there are healing spaces on the board and the game gave you two extra party members to choose from, because you end up needing all the help you can get. Once you've mustered up enough courage and polished off that whole bag of Senzu beans, we finally persevere and slay the evil Majin Buu. All of our friends celebrate the victory, and Yamcha's apparently just happy that he survived in general. After many battles hard fought, the world is finally saved. We get a neat little shot of Earth from space and some smooth jazz plays as our story closes out and our journey through Dragon World comes to a close. And that was Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2. At least what some of the Dragon World had to offer. I love Dragon Ball Z with a passion. And I'm not sure what it is, but this game tickles the part of my brain that loves it too. I think it was the perfect sequel to follow the smash hit that came before it, Dragon Ball Z Budokai, and the perfect bridge between the powerhouse to the fans that followed, Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. I noticed a lot of hate for this game, and whenever I look into why it's hated, I always see that it comes back to the board game style story mode. It wasn't even included in the HD remasters of the series for Xbox and PS3. But if you can look past that, this game has so much to offer. The story can change in varying degrees, and there are so many collectibles that you can get, characters you can unlock, and skills to be learned. Personally, I love the board game story, and everything that followed suit. Like being able to choose who was in your party each time opened up for some fun alternatives to a story we've heard so many times, but never get tired of hearing. There's the fun new fusions and absorptions, the streamlined and refined gameplay mechanics, and just the fun Dragon Ball Z fighter at its core. So if you're looking for a Dragon Ball Z game to play, or maybe a nostalgic trip from the past, give this one a shot and let me know what you think. And as always, thanks for watching.